Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Inside Boxing Weekly. I'm your host tonight, Jeremiah Pricer, and with me, as always, is John Einronhofer. How are you doing, John? Hey, Jeremiah. Good, good to be here. Yeah, it is always good to talk boxing with you, John. And yeah, I've got a note that Mike is currently away. Uh, the grueling truth was able to get credentials uh, for the, the big NCAA basketball tournament that's going on. So we've got a lot of our guys covering that. So Mike won't make it, and he might not be able to make it a few times during the week. So it might just be me going solo uh, if I can find some other co-hosts. But uh, as always, you know, we're brought to you by the Retired Boxers Foundation. Go ahead and check out them on Facebook, Alex Ramos. They do a great job, you know, keeping fighters uh, up to date and, and, you know, just secure financially. Uh, we're also brought to you by mybookie.ag. Uh, you click on the banner, go ahead and bet. You get some money back. Use the, the code TGT50. Uh, with that said, we're going to move on to tonight's action. I, I, th- I think it's probably – Prudent that we start with tonight's main event, or you want to start with Anthony Peterson and, and Mendez? I, I, I'd like yeah, to start with I, this card first, and then just kind of work our way into other stuff. Yeah, I agree. I think let's let's talk about tonight since it just ended uh, in half an hour or so ago, and it ended up being a uh, a good night of action on national TV in the United States, and that's important for the future health of boxing. And uh, you know, we got uh, we we got some we got a we, we got a great fight in the main event, and we got some other. Uh, good action. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll start with the undercard. We'll start with the the uh, the lesser of the two brothers. We'll talk about Anthony Peterson. He fought Arginis Mendez, and Mendez has been one of those guys who's been around for quite a while. He's he's kind of been relegated to the status of of gatekeeper at this point. And so, you know, guys like Luke Campbell and whatnot have been you know fighting him again. You know, to to break into the top ten. Uh, you know, fight better fighters. And Peterson, to me, has, well, I think to just about anybody, Peterson has been, ever since he lost to Brandon Rios, he's been on the, the, the real slow road to contendership. Uh, you know, he, he, he had that fight, and, and he's just been taking his sweet time. I mean, the guy has almost 40 fights and has yet to really fight somebody of note besides Brandon Rios, and tonight he met a guy like Mendes, Mendes, who is a crafty individual. Again, a guy who's who typically doesn't go out easy. Uh, you know, he's he's a boxer type, uh, and Peterson just couldn't get it get it done tonight. I I had him edging the fight, but obviously it was very close. Would you Would you think of the action? I thought it was a you know a, a pretty decent fight. It was just about even money kept going in, which is interesting. You know, uh, especially with televised boxing, we don't get that as much as we should and we need. And we had it twice tonight. This was the first one, and um, you know, I, I I found it interesting the way you uh, introduced the fight, Jeremiah, because it's accurate. But uh, I think for me, I want to rewind a little bit back to use an old term, uh, almost work. <laughs> Or more appropriate as, as we're going back to the the early years of the Petersons' careers, and this was a throwback. I think it was the first time they'd been on the same TV car since 2007. But when they came up in the old ESPN Friday Night Fights, they showed them together a lot, and uh, and then they worked their way up. Of course, uh, you know Lamont eventually ended up moving faster. But but I'm going back to earlier in their career. It was always Anthony was the guy originally who caught my eye because. I, I always look for firepower because I think it's important for how far a fighter is going to go. And, and Lamont didn't have the firepower. And, and some of his earlier fights, were, it was unlike tonight, but we're going way back. You know, some of his earlier fights, even for a prospect, were kind of dull because he, he didn't have the punching power. And, and Anthony had, had the boxing skill and the punch, punching power. So he, he looked to me at that time like the brother who had the potential – to go farther, and then as you accurately described, his career, uh, you know, slowed up. He had a disqualification against Brandon Rios, and he got inactive, and he just just about disappeared. And here he was coming back in a fight that that became relatively significant because you're right about the way Mendez was headed for that gatekeeper type role. You know, he got knocked out by Robert Easter when he was still in the legit top tens at the end when the lightweight division. He was at the bottom part of the top ten when the lightweight division was weaker, and then, like you said, uh, he you know he got decisioned by Luke Campbell, but he has been on a mini run uh, against credible opponents lately, where he you know decisioned Ivan Redcatch, and then 
you know, he beat Eddie Ramirez, who at one time uh, was a decent prospect. He's fallen on a little bit of hard times and over a couple fights, but uh, you know, he, uh, you know, Mendez decision him a little while back. So like you said, he's crafty. He actually, the more I watched him over the years, seeing him now as he got older, he is a better fighter than I thought. So there was some intrigue going in. Um, it wasn't a spectacular fight or anything, but I thought that, um, you know, Anthony Peterson was using his jab well, box well. I saw it the same way you did. I thought he did enough to edge it out, but you're not going to argue with the draw. But uh, there was a couple things that I didn't that, that I didn't like that I saw from him. There were a few things I liked. I liked his jab, and, and he actually looks to me like he's got something left. But the two things I didn't like was, as I said, even when he's becoming active, he's still been getting knockouts. He was always the Peterson brother that was the bigger puncher. He didn't show that tonight. You know, he, ne- he never, for some reason, was willing to, to stand and go toe-to-toe with Mendez at all. He, he never got his power shots off with a lot of authority. He would flurry with the combinations, but not hard. Uh, and, and that's where I was disappointed in one aspect. And the second aspect I was disappointed was with three rounds to go in the fight, to me, it looked like, you know, he had to fight one. All he had to do was maybe win one other round. And, and, and you know, his eye was swelling up. And I, I guess I'm just going to assume at his age 34 with the inactivity, he was running out of the gas. And he let Mendez sweep those last three rounds. And, and that cost him. But, you know, I would think being fair to both of these fighters, I'm not saying that either of them are going to get to the top of the lightweight or 140-pound division. But I think both of them did enough, and both of them are credible enough performers that I think they both get a little bit of a win out of this fight, even though it's a draw. Yeah, and, I, and I, you know, Mendez, he, he's going to keep getting those. Uh, with this performance, I think he's going to keep earning fights like he has been. I, I mean, he's, he's a guy who shows up. He'll give you rounds. He's a tough out. With Peterson, it, it's tough It's tough to kind of figure out where he goes from here. I think, I mean, he's 34 years old. He is a bit younger than Lamont. Uh, I would like to see him, you know, just – because he doesn't seem that ambitious towards getting towards the top. I'd like him to just be put in stylistically fun fights, you know, uh, maybe a Roscoe or Saucedo, uh, you know, maybe even Beltran. Uh, you know, for me, those would be fun and, and uh, competitive fights. Uh, I was like you, or I thought Anthony was going to be the better of the two brothers. Then, you know, Lamont ended up showing us, a, a, you know, a, a number of wrinkles to his game and ended up competing at the higher level. And uh, I, that, that's kind of my take is I'd like to see Anthony in fun fights. Again, he just, he just doesn't seem like a guy who's ever going to make uh, a splash at the top of the division, especially 140 pounds, which is, you know, is pretty top heavy. I think, you know, pro Ray looks very good to me. Taylor looks very good. Uh, he, he just doesn't look quite like he would be able to hang out, hang with the guys who are, you know, in the top five, the Ramirez types, the, uh, again, the pro grays, et cetera. Um, but with that, with that said, you know, Anthony, again, he, he hasn't lived up to his brother's potential and his brother was also on the card tonight. His brother fought in the main event against Sergey Lipinets. And I know this fight, uh, you looked at the odds beforehand and it was very, very close. And, you know, the, when you're looking at this fight as it's playing out in real time, it's very, very close. I mean, a lot of people had Lamont sweeping the early rounds or winning most of them at least. I, I thought the second was pretty damn close. and I thought most of the rounds were pretty damn close. <clears throat> but to me, as I saw it, it, it seemed like Lamont, and he's a, he's a wily veteran. You could see his experience playing out. He's always been one of the more committed body punchers in the sport. You know, his lack of power is obviously what hurts him there. But if he had a good punch, he'd probably be breaking a lot of guys get down because, uh, again, he, he's just – he's real committed. I mean, uh, against Lipinets, he was he was going there consistently. Even when Lipinets started to land the harder punches, he never lost his dedication there. Uh, you know, he's a good jabber. He's active with his hands. Uh, you know, he's got subtle slickness where, you know, it's hard to hit him cleanly a lot of times. I, I just like him. You know, he's one of those guys who, 
you know, besides the PED thing, you know, which obviously is staying on the past, he's been one of those guys who's just been, I've always liked his well-roundedness. Again, he's never been a big puncher, but you know, you, you see against Danny Garcia, he could box a bit. A lot of people had him winning that fight. Uh, you know, he could fight a bit, you know, he was aggressive against Timothy Bradley. Of course that, that hurt him in that fight. He wasn't quite as, uh, you know, he wasn't that exper- experienced there, but he, he was good fi- against Amir Khan. He was the aggressor. So he, he's a guy who go forward. He could go backward. Again, dedicated body puncher, jabber. He, he just, to me, he comes across as one of those guys who has a high ring IQ. But he, to me, in this fight, he looks like age has hit him quite a bit. He's still obviously serviceable. Um, again, for me, the early rounds, I thought Peterson was taking them. He just seemed a bit more active, a bit more accurate with his shots. And eventually Lipinet started to catch him, started to break him down a bit. It was just one of those things to me where it looked like Peterson was landing more, but Lipinets was landing harder. And to Lipinets' credit, he threw a ton of punches. I was actually excited about that aspect of his game where he just kept coming. He was aggressive. He was jabbing consistently like Peterson was. Uh, he was also dedicated to the body. And, you know, the right hand of his is, is a good, potent weapon. I mean, he's not a one-punch knockout artist kind of guy, but he is he's dedicated to that punch. It's technical. It's accurate. It's hard. And eventually he got the job done, and the knockout I thought was, was flashy. What did you think, John? It ended up being a great fight. I thought you you know, summarized it well. Um, you know, Lamont Peterson, it, it's funny. I thought I thought it would be a tight fight. Yeah, in a certain way, despite the way it ended, I thought Lamont Peterson actually came with being a 35-year-old welterweight. I thought he actually came with a little more than I thought he would. Um, you know, like, like you said, I, I think really he was taking the early rounds and he was standing right there with Lipinets and Lipinets, uh, you know he's he's it's funny because he's five foot seven, but he's a, he's a physically strong guy, and and a lot of one thing a lot of I've said this a lot of times, but but it just always seems to hold true. Um, a lot of former kickboxers that come to boxing have a lot of stamina, uh, and you know he he is one of those guys. So you know Peterson was standing right there with him, and it did remind you of what you said that. You, you look at his entire career, except for the PED stain, you know, the guy has had an, an admirable career otherwise and, and a lot of skills, like you said, a lot of versatility, except the one thing that you look now throughout his career, if, if he would have had a bigger punch, uh, he, he's a guy that really may, could have settled at the top of, you know, divisions, 140, 147 during the course of his career. And he was fighting there anyway and, you know, picked up some, you know, alphabet belt but uh you know he picked up alphabet belts but he he uh you know wasn't real wasn't one of the top you know real top best very best uh in the sport um type of thing and you know it's really he, he showed he showed heart and uh you know skills but he just didn't have that punch and i think it got him again tonight because like you said you know it, it was amazing with a strong guy like Lipinets that he was standing right there with him and committing to the body. Um, the thing that was interesting here, and some people did pick up on it. I saw, you know, after the fight, and I think it's accurate. We've talked about it on our show quite a bit since you know we follow these guys regularly. Um, you know, Lipinets, Joe Goosen's got him back to the old Lipinets, and and if anybody wants to listen to our old podcast, they can hear, you know, Jeremiah and I particularly had discussed this issue a lot with Lipinets. We've been following him for a long time since he first got over here and got with PBC and, and, and even before. And, you know, he went back to that old style, but I think, you know, Lipinets was working with Buddy McGirt before that, and McGirt had him boxing a lot. And there were times he didn't look as good and, you know, there were times maybe he didn't look quite as effective, but I was saying that whole time, you know, Buddy McGirt's got him moving his head more and got him boxing so he can mix that up with the pressure and extend his career. Now, he did not box at all tonight at avoid shots at all, and he had a spectacular win. But Lamont Peterson is not a puncher, and the welterweight division is – one of the toughest in boxing and has a lot of talent there, especially with the PBC guys. So what I'm saying is Joe Goosen's a very good trainer too. And so is Buddy McGirt. 
but I'm saying I like it from a fan perspective and excitement, and I like seeing Lipinets put that pressure on and get that knock, get those knockouts. But he's 30 years old; he's not going to be able to do this for long in this division. Uh, and he might not even be able to do it with the competition in this division over more than a couple more fights. So what I'm saying is. I'm not faulting Joe Goosen for doing that, but I knew what Buddy McGirt was trying to do. And I think we have a Lipinets now who's going to be extremely exciting, but his shelf life's not going to be much longer because when he gets in with the bigger punchers in the welterweight division and fights like that and takes those shots, uh, you know, he, he's uh, not going to have a lot of shelf life. So what I, what I'm saying is PVC's obviously got the opponents and, uh, it might not be some of them might not be great matchups for him, but he's got to make the moves now. He's got to make his move now because if he's going to be with Joe Goose and fighting every fight, which this style, which is exciting and effective for him, it's not going to be a long shelf life though. So uh, he's already 30 years old. So he, he he's a guy that uh, in a tough division and a tough division to to get those guys. He's going to have to uh, have hope his PBC connections get him a big fight soon. Yeah, and speaking of that, I wanted to ask you real quick. So, how would you liken his chances? I mean, obviously, you know, we, we I think we both believe that uh, you know Spence you know, beats him up. I, to me, Lipinets doesn't look like a big 147 pounder. Uh, you know, just it just his stature, and actually, he didn't look ripped to me. But if I'm looking on his side of the street, the PB, PBC aisle. You know, obviously Spence beats him. I, I, you know, I favor Thurman to beat him. Uh, but how does he do against somebody like Danny Garcia, who does have issues with throwing his hands? Well, you know, you make a good point. I, I guess w- when I'm saying w- when I'm saying what I said, I sort of had myself focused on the top of the division at PBC, which is Errol Spence. And you know, he, he can't take the shots from Errol Spence with that style. He, he just simply can't. Um, but you're right, you know, and, and tell you the truth, even Keith Thurman, I mean, Keith Thurman's only five foot seven, um, and, and he's been moving more. He's not punching like he used to, not punching with the same authority. Maybe it's not a, maybe it's not a hard uh, style matchup for uh, Lipinets, but he's going to take a lot of shots. And Sean Part- Porter's not looking like he did. Uh, Ugas did not let his hands go enough in his last fight. I mean, you know, now that we mention it, that would seem to be the way I would see things falling. Uh, Ugas, Ugas proved he is a legit top 10 guy, maybe a threat to be a top five guy, but I don't think he's going to have a dance partner, in my opinion, the way the PBC guys are going to fall. So maybe uh, maybe that could be a, a good matchup uh, because if, if Ugas is going to, you know, be – try to be a little slicker and not let his hands go as much like he did against Porter. You know, Lipinets is going to put that pressure on him and, and make him do some things. Could be a, could be an entertaining fight. Um, you know, even with Porter, it, it, it could be an entertaining fight, but I think Porter's going to get Spence and Thurman's going to get Pacquiao. I think that's the way this is going to play out. But let's say another thing that Jeremiah, we didn't touch on. I didn't see anybody else touch on it tonight and they probably should have in fairness. And this is sometimes where you got to let the dust settle in boxing. You know, Mikey Garcia's win over Lipinex looks pretty good after what we saw tonight because he dropped him and, you know, he clearly won the fight. And, you know, Lipinex showed how strong uh, he can can be, even though he's not that tall when he comes to put some pressure on you. And, and, you know, Mikey Garcia was able to withstand that and drop him and win a clear decision. So, um, you know, a lot of what happened to Mikey Garcia might be that he was just in with Errol Spence. Yeah. Real quick. Uh, just, just to, to repeat, how, how do you think he would do against somebody like uh, Danny Garcia? Somebody who's, I, I think an okay. inch taller, but has two inches longer reach. I, th- I think Garcia's reach is 68 and Lipinets is 66. And again, Garcia does have problems throwing his hands from time to time. You, you think that'd be competitive? You think he has any shot? Yeah, he does have a shot because uh, it's a good style matchup for Lipinets because Garcia doesn't let his hands go. Now, I think Danny Garcia has more power than he shows because he just does not let his hands go enough. And, and he tries to, you know, wait too long and, and wait for, you know, perfect openings and that type of stuff. So uh, what I'm saying there is I think Danny Garcia can hurt Lipinets, but 
uh, he's going to have to let his hands go more to, to make sure he puts some hurt on him because Lippinets is going to be active and keep coming and put pressure on and, and Danny Garcia doesn't throw. Look, uh, I do think that Danny Garcia still beat Lamont Peterson, but look in the second half of the fight when he wasn't throwing, how strong he let Lamont Peterson come on in that fight and almost pull it out. And now you see, you know, of course, Lippinette's fighting a little bit older version of Lamont Peterson. But again, I, I thought despite the way it ended, and, and I'm not uh, disputing that Lamont Peterson should retire. I think he should, but I don't think, I mean, I don't think he looked, I thought he looked good. I mean, he was just in with a determined Lippinets who was, was throwing a ton of punches. And that version of Lippinets might not last long, but he's going to be able to do that to a lot of people, except maybe some of the guys at the top. But, yeah, I think uh, that is a good matchup. And, and, you know, maybe if Danny Garcia doesn't have a dance partner, um, we'll see how he looks against Granados on April 20th. But maybe it's not impossible that one could happen, and I do think that would be one that Lippinets would have a shot at. Yeah, yeah, and th- that's why I asked, just because uh, it, it feels like Danny Garcia is going to be left out in the cold a little bit. You know, I don't think they'd throw him in against U- with Ugas. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just seems like, uh, you know, Garcia, he's, again, he's just going to be left out a little bit because Thurman, Spence, all of them, it, it just seems as if they're all kind of looking for – uh, each other, right? I mean, it seems like PBC is is finally going to get it together and have them, uh, you know, sweep up this side of the street and then focus on a potential showdown with Terrence Crawford down the road. Uh, one other quick question. Does Lipinets enter the top 10 at 147 now, or does he still need a little bit better win? For me, this would be enough. It would, would Except that the division is so tough, and, you know, you know you, you're – have to make these calls for transnational, which is, you know, uh, the, the most independent ratings we have. And, you know, Lupinets, I, I could see even if I, if I was, you know, casting a ballot, I'd be saying, you know, I, I could see making him a, a nine or a 10 guy. But then I look at guys like, um, you know, Jamal James. And I think Jamal James has been coming on looking better and better. Uh, he deserves uh, a look there. And if maybe if you'll remember off the top of your head better than me. I did. I'm trying to think who they had at 10, whoever they had at 10, I thought didn't belong there. If I recall, and I would put like Jamal. Yeah, um, or um, so um, Amir Khan is 10 for training. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah it, that, that, that's it. That, that's the, to me, that's the little bit of the British bias there. Amir Khan's got no business being at number 10 at this point in, in that division. That, that, yeah. That, I, I, I will say that I've, I voted against that. Yeah, and then you made the right call. So I would definitely put Lipinets, uh or – and, again, you can't go on the past – you know, the past guy's age and things, it's not all – some of these people get caught up nowadays, in, and I've said this before, in, quote, resume. It's, it's not all resume or just exactly where you just beat this guy. It's definitely part of that, but it's not all that. And, and to me, when you take the whole picture, you know, Amir Khan just clearly does not belong. So – uh, I would have uh, Jamal James or Lipinets in the 10th spot. I would be okay with either of those guys being there. Um, you know, yeah. Lipinets I, I, has been in. Yeah, either either guy I could live with, but Lipinets has been in with, you know, Mikey Garcia now. To me, I don't really care that that was at 140. I, I think that stuff gets overrated. So yeah, he's been in with Mikey Garcia, and now he's been in with uh, a determined Lamont Peterson, and you got to look at that. Like, uh, I always like to get back to the old – Gil Clancy thing. You gotta, you gotta take into account which version of the guy shows up. And even though he's 35 years old and he's saying he retired, I thought Lamont Peterson showed up with enough tonight and enough determination that that means something to me. The way I saw him show up and Lipinets beat him tonight. So uh, I think yeah. you know Lipinets or Jamal James should should be in there, and Amir Khan doesn't belong there. And I think we'll see that when he's in there with Crawford. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think guys like you know Kovia, Kovialowskis are on the edge there. There's there's a lot right. of good fighters in that division, you know. So it, it's it's going to be tough, you know, parsing that out and and, and getting in there. But let's uh, let's move on to you know uh, fights on Saturday. So uh, what do you think of Kubrat Pula versus Dinu? Uh, Pula obviously okay. had a nasty little cut there. Ended up getting the job done. Little, little controversy surrounding the stoppage though. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll tell you, it ended up being a really good fight. Um, 
I like what you know. I like what PBC is trying to do, and I like what Top Rank's trying to do when they get stuff on ESPN. Um, you know, this was a fight to me. Why I'm mentioning PBC is I thought PBC, you know, got lucky like in December when they had Harrison and uh, Jermel Charlo, and then um, you know Jamal Charlo had to face Matt Korbev as a last minute replacement instead of Willie Monroe, and that fight was really tight. And then they had Thurman and, uh, you know, the Josecito Lopez. What I'm saying, lucky, means if you look at the odds, those fights shouldn't have been good, okay? And they were on national TV. They turned, they turned out good, and it's good for boxing. Those fights are really important because in addition to your regular boxing hardcore fans, which are the majority of these viewers by far nowadays, you're still – one of the big reasons they're there is you're still looking for that casual viewer, that sports fan that's going to be flipping the channels or coming in off a lead in who's going to see that and want to come back for more. So those fights are really, really important. A lot of people I think don't get that, but they are. So Pulliv and, and Dinu, I had read, you know, when they were talking about even putting it together that Dinu didn't want to take the fight. And even though it ended up being a really good fight, maybe you saw a little bit of that at the end. Um, but, what I'm what I'm getting around to the main point is top rank got a good one last night that we didn't have any reason to expect was going to be a good one. Um, you know, Dinu landed two huge right hands that that opened a horrible gash over Pulev, and uh, you know Pulev he did he did show some grit. He really wanted it. He seemed like he uh, understood that he was in the spotlight there. You know, he come coming to the U.S. being a headliner. And uh, apparently there's a lot of Bulgarians in the audience. And, you know, he, he fought that way. He, he came back and, and, you know, Dinu kind of folded. He just, he just stopped firing back. And, you know, the controversy about the stoppage, though, um, I, I, can't, I, can't, you know, I can't say it's exaggerated or anything. I mean, Polov hit the guy in the back of the head when he was clearly on the canvas. And, you know, getting hit in the back of the head like that is definitely not good for you. And we're just not going to know for sure. I mean, it certainly didn't help Dinu. So um, we're not going to know exactly to what extent uh, it cost him. But, you know, that to me also, even though we hate to see fights end like that, it's kind of illogical to call that. I mean, the referee ruled it an unintentional foul. You're throwing a punch. <laughs> you're throwing a punch when the guy's down on the canvas and you're calling it a foul, you're calling it a foul, that sort of by definition can't be an unintentional foul. I mean, you know, it's not like the guy was sitting on the on the rope and Polev didn't see it or something. You know, the guy the guy was laying down on the yeah. canvas and got hit in the back of the head. So that, that yeah, that was the, that was the one part that was a little bit unpleasant about the way that uh, finished last night but but the action the action part of the fight ended up uh ended up being being good and i think top rank and espn just like pbc has in those fights i mentioned i think they got away with one in a positive sense last night yeah and i, I will say this about pulev i mean he if you look at the rankings he has been a contender for years now i mean you know he got a shot against vladimir klitschko years ago and and he actually wasn't uh too far out of his depth in that fight i mean he ended up getting starched cold with a a huge left hook but he wasn't completely out of his death depth i mean he's 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 got some good size i think he's about six four you know he was a really good amateur uh he's he's sort of basic in his approach but he's good at what he does. You know, he's, he's got some nuance to his game. Again, even if it's basic, I know that kind of sounds uh, counterintuitive, but what I'm saying is he, he does a few things, but he does them well. Yeah, he's a legit, like you said, you, you have to remember, he is a, he's a legit top ten guy. You know, when you throw out the alphabet stuff and, and all the belts and everything, he, he's still he's been in the legit top ten for a lot of years now, and he still is. I mean, he's in everybody's, and he would be mine too. He has not, he's never fallen out of the legit top ten, and so so you know, ESPN, Bob Arum, top rank, going into last night, you had I, you didn't like the matchup on paper, but heavyweights you never know, and that's what we got last night. And the one thing you did have to give them at least was 
I mean, he's a legit top ten guy. It's not just some guy who has some alphabet ranking and would be a nobody's legitimate top ten. I mean, he, he's a legit top ten contender. So there, there's some there's some value to that. So uh, it, it was a it was a pretty good night, you know, I'm, for boxing getting that fight. Um, you know, I always then get curious because then you, you wonder, I think you should in the U S I mean, then how many people saw it? Uh, we'll, you know, we'll see that stuff Monday or Tuesday because you had FS one goes to less houses in the U S than regular ESPN, but you had a good fight on FS one tonight, a good main event. You had a good main event. It turned out to be a good main event on ESPN on Saturday night. So be curious to see how many people actually watch those fights. Yes, it will be. And and we also saw on that day, we saw, <clears throat> sorry, on the undercard, we saw Jesse Magdaleno against Rico Ramos. And uh, Jesse did not look good. Uh, I will say that Rico Ramos is, he's not going to be a name that's familiar with a lot of people, but he will be a familiar name with hardcore boxing fans. Uh, this is a guy who broke into the top 10, I believe it's uh, in 2011, and he was viewed as a, a good prospect. Uh, he was he was seen as one of those guys who had pretty good punching power. He was he was pretty well rounded. And then gear, you know, an eight eight win uh, eight no Guillermo Regan, I would just beat him from pillar to post. But then after that, it, it seemed like that that shot his confidence, and you know, he suffered a couple losses. And he, he's kind of been sort of like the the Mendez type fighter where he's been kind of a gatekeeper you know he's he's had six losses in total you know he's fought a a, a few number of well-known names but again he's not a guy who's void of talent altogether again this is a guy who has fought at a, a on a high level and uh again I just didn't think Jesse looked good what do you think John no he didn't and, and I hate to say it because I've I've liked Jesse Magdaleno a lot over the last few years, you know, he had that long layoff before dog Bay and then he hit dog Bay early and he almost had him out of there. And, and, you know, I think he probably wasn't ready then for what came next. And he came off a layoff and I was hoping he got it back. I was leaning towards to think he, he would, but I did not like the way he looked uh, Saturday night either. I I was really watching that fight to see how he looked. I figured he'd win. And, um, he didn't look good. I, I think I could see what he was trying to work on. Uh, in the Dog Bay fight, he didn't jab at all. He was throwing all power punches. Landed a lot, but he ended up losing a war of attrition. And and it looked like, even though, of course, Ramos is a totally different type of fighter than Dog Bay, it looked like Magdalena was trying to work on the jab. But but then it was too much of that where where I wasn't seeing some of the other things that Magdaleno did well. About the best I could say for him is, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Ramos has had some career. He's got had some amateur pedigree, but he was kind of doing his, dare I say it because it's a heavyweight, but it reminded me, and you don't usually get that with the smaller guys, but he was kind of doing a little bit of the Kevin Johnson thing. It looked to me like, you know, he, he just, he just was there to defend. I mean, he, he, he wasn't there to, to throw any punches and really go for the win. Um, and, and he was just there to defend and, it's it's hard when you got a guy in there like that who won't even give you an opening to, to you know land something because they're they're just def- they just come to defend against you all night and not do anything. But still, you have to help a guy like that out of there. And I think at featherweight, even though it's a lower weight class, not like the the punching of the heavyweights, but you know Jesse Magdaleno, unlike his brother. Just where we talked about the Peterson brothers, same thing here. You know, Jesse's the puncher out of the two, and and I, I know he's got the firepower to get somebody like Ramos out of there, and and he he just really didn't go for that last night. Don't think it was um, that good of a performance, but you know, you mentioned something with the PBC guys, and it's it's tying into one of my themes for the last week or two. Um, you know, top rank suddenly has with their association with Frank Warren, which really is a good thing the way I'm starting to look at this stuff. They've got a lot of featherweight fights available now. Um, they could go in house just like PBC can with the welterweights. And, and I think after all these years of, of we're focusing on, on crossover fights and we'd like to see Spence Crawford or Joshua Wilder and crossover, I mean, in these TV 
promotional entities now. You've got three main factions, and the U.S. drives things just about worldwide. So everybody's got to be affected with that, whether you're a British fan or uh, even you know an Asian fan, European fan. You're going to be indirectly affected. So I, I, I've reached a point where I think that these entities are not giving us their best in-house matchups either, and we should just start focusing on that first. So that's going to be my- – that's going to be my new thing that I want to focus on and, and call them out on it. So why I mentioned that with Magdaleno is now you've got Frank Warren associated, you know, they, so, and, you know, Frampton's just signed the co-promotional deal with top Frank. So you got Warrington's available. Uh, Frampton's available. Oscar Valdez is available. Shakur Stevenson's available. And now they got Magdaleno. These guys need to fight. You know, these guys need to fight each other, just like, and I'm going to say with the PBC, you know, let's have Pacquiao fight Thurman, let's have Spence fight Porter, the winner fight, everybody seems okay with that. Let's start getting these top-notch in-house matchups that could be made, especially if we forget these needless weight classes that are a distinction that's not necessary a lot of times with these junior classes, and have these guys all, all start fighting in-house. We're worried about these crossover matchups that never happen. Let's let's get the best in-house fights fights we can get. Yeah, and on top of that, I mean, you, pointing to 126 for the PBC, you got to give us Leo Santa Cruz versus Gary Russell Jr. Right. I mean, for me, that determines who who the man is at 126. I mean, uh, Warrington's a good fighter. You know, I like him, but. Uh, it, uh, still, you know, he beat, he beat Frampton. That's fine. But to me, he still, he looks like a third place kind of guy. I mean, Frampton just, did, right. he doesn't, you know, because of his lack of power, uh, you know, again, I, I like the guy, you know, I appreciate his efforts. He's got a good following uh, again, nothing against the guy personally. It's just one of those things where when I look at Santa Cruz and I look at Gary Russell jr, they appear to me to be on a level higher than, than Warrington is. Then again, who knows? Maybe one day we'll be proven wrong, you know. But the, you, you look at the in-house fights. So I mean, war. You just got to do Santa Cruz versus Gary Russell Jr. To me, that it, it's just a must-have. You know, I, I heard that um, you know Gary Russell Jr. is, is taking on Kiko Martinez this year. I, I can live with that, even though I, I really don't like that matchup. Kiko has been taking beatings for years yeah, now. I mean, he was losing. He lost Carl Frampton twice already. You know, Scott Quigg. The guy is not anywhere near an elite level operator. And Santa Cruz, and Santa Cruz uh, he, took, him, took him out too, didn't he? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but it, to me, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, Kiko Martinez, if he's a filler fight, I can deal with it. But you got to give me, uh, you know, Russell can't keep doing this one fight a year thing. You got you got to give me the best of the best. And again, you got to make the big fights happen. And so long as it's happening on one side of the aisle. It's it's better, right? It, it's it's easier to deal with, uh, but but anyways, uh, let, let's just hope and hope we're getting that because you know 2019 has not been a particularly good year so far. Like you said, we have been getting sort of lucky with some of these pairings, but in general, uh, when Errol Spence versus Mikey Garcia is the biggest fight that we've had all year uh, in terms of notoriety. Uh, again, I, I just don't. I think we can do a lot better as a sport. Anyways, we'll move on to some uh, some other action. Uh, did you end up catching Andrew Selby versus uh, Julio Cesar Martinez? I did catch the finish of it. I didn't catch the entire fight though. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make note of that because I, I didn't catch all of it either. Uh, <clears throat> I know that Andrew Selby, he, he's a Welshman and and you know he's a talented guy and actually he has a a win over Christopher Rosales who i believe is at the top of the division right now so he he had beat him previously with less experience uh and Rosales was able to beat uh who was it he was able to he came in as an underdog against Patty Barnes the the Irish Olympian ended up stopping him in four but he upset Diego Haiga who was is seen by a lot of people as, as sort of the, I don't want to say the next Inua, but he was he was he looked like one of those guys who could really bang you out, good stylist. Uh, and anyways, um, uh, Selby had already beaten him previously, so Selby was a big favorite over this Martinez fella. Well, Selby ended up getting stopped in the last round in a fight that he was winning with a body shot, so that sort of derails the plans of Selby. Uh, you know, fighting a guy like Charlie Edwards, which would have been a, a big British showdown, or a big, sorry, a big domestic showdown. 
Uh, but I think a lot of us saw the Sam Maxwell versus Sabri Settery fight. And uh, tell us what you saw there. Yeah, I, 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 the fight was the fight was unbelievable, and for even more reasons than the final final highlight, which was unbelievable. But I had seen even before that moment, you know, something that I'd never seen before in a fight in all the years I've been watching boxing, which was. You had Maxwell get dropped twice early. Uh, I've seen that before, and uh, it, it, was, it was awkward shots, but they were thrown quickly, and, and he was he was getting hurt. But what I'd never seen before was in the final round, before the the highlight reel clip, was that Maxwell then got hurt by another shot badly, and the the Frenchman Sabiri elected to taunt Maxwell and not throw any follow up punches. Before the dramatic finish that we'll always keep talking about even happened, I said to myself, watching that, I've never seen that before. I've never seen a guy hurt a guy and badly, and rather than try to finish, just taunt the, the guy, and it was in the final round. And right after that, then you saw that taunting that was on the highlight real clip when then Maxwell threw the right-hand bomb and, and caught him right on the butt and, and, and ended it. And, and it, it was just unbelievable. Maxwell was bruised up. It appeared that he was losing the fight. Uh, what detracts from it slightly that people saw afterward was that apparently he was not going to lose the fight without the knockout despite being dropped twice. Um, but we like to forget about that, and I think in history we'll probably try to forget about that as we watch that clip, but we won't talk about that because it takes a little bit away from it. But – it was absolutely unbelievable. It lived up to the post-fight hype when you're seeing that clip because I'd, I'd never seen anything like it. Guy was down twice, got rocked badly in the last round. You thought he was losing. And for some reason, and, and you know, the commentators were saying at the time, too, you, it was obvious. Severi decided to taunt him instead of trying to finish, didn't fall, throw anything to try to finish and I it looked he could have finished him and then he got caught with a bomb and knocked out so that's going to be one of your classic boxing never give up metaphors and we're going to see that clip for a long time but it was a really good fight before that um I was surprised I did watch that card uh from the UK and it, it was interesting because the the lower undercard bouts that being one of them and the one before that was a couple of um Lester uh, local guys fighting and they, they put on a good fight too. Um, challenger and, uh, Haywood, uh, good fight. And, uh, then that one with, uh, with the uh, Maxwell fight was a great fight. And, uh, unfortunately then it led into Nathan Gorman, Kevin Johnson. <laughs> and that, if you were watching the card that, that sucked the air out of the room for the rest of the uh, evening, if you're in the UK or the afternoon in the U S yeah, especially on the heels of the uh, Daniel Dubois performance, in my opinion. You know, like that, that's what I was thinking about when I was watching the bout. You know, Gorman, again, is, is, he's a guy that I like. I mean, again, I'm not saying that he's going to – with all the up-and-comers at heavyweight, he's not one of those guys who, who lights up the room for me. But uh, uh, he reminds me of an Andrew, Andy Ruiz kind of guy where he's got quick hands, you know, and he's never really going to reach the top, but you know, he can provide – something I, I don't know he just stylistically he reminds me of Ruiz a little bit and uh yeah that fight was just uh yeah it was pretty pretty boring and again on the, the heels of the Danny Dubois because they, they've been talking about pairing Gorman and Dubois and again after watching Dubois uh light his man up and stop him early I, you just got to favor Dubois there the the guy that I found most impressive was uh Oh, I, I know I'm going to get this name wrong, but Joshua Watsi. Did you end up seeing that fight, or did you end up seeing him, uh, him perform? Yeah, I, I, people were very uh, impressed with the performance, but I, that one and all this action over the weekend, I did not get to see that one yet. So, But uh, I did see a lot of uh, reviews of his performance afterward. Some people were extremely ecstatic. I don't want to pass judgment uh, either way because I, didn't, I haven't seen the fight yet. You know, I, I will – and I'm going to, you know, keep an open mind on it. But I, I saw some people really, really touting him that, you know, he, he was this, you know, 
as good as any prospect they'd ever seen type of thing. I mean, I, you know, but I, I have not, I have not seen the fight yet. John. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So you're breaking up a little bit there, but uh, okay. if, if you're, if you're saying that he is uh, again, not you, but if, if somebody is saying he's the best prospect you ever seen, you just haven't been watching boxing that long. I mean, I, <laughs> okay, I, was wondering, it, I thought, did I miss something? Did I miss something there? Because, you know, it was kind of hardcore boxing people. And I was just, and you know, some of them can get carried away too, or you don't know how long they've been watching, even if they're watching a lot now. Yeah. But it could, you know, could be somebody younger or something like that. But I saw a couple things like that and I thought, God, you know, I, I, I'm going to really have to check this out, I guess, after the fact. Yeah, yeah. It, it, again, he, he looked pretty damn good. And uh, he, he's certainly one of the more impressive uh, Brits I've seen in recent years. Uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, hey, he looks like a world level. Well, I, you just got to pump the brakes. I've seen a ton of talented guys who have, you know, been in the game a lot of them just don't end up being who you think they were i mean maybe josh was a, a, you know very good fighter he's got everything you'd want in a guy and maybe he just doesn't have a chin maybe he doesn't have grit you know the, we've seen a ton of those kind of fighters uh just since i've been around and again i haven't been a boxing fan for that long but again just in the time that i've been watching boxing you, you see guys who are very very talented and, and just never pan out yeah, I mean, it, it can happen, so I'm going to have to, uh, you know, I'm going to have to check that out, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep, you know, of course I know who he is and, you know, seeing some, but I'm going to have to, uh, I'm just going to have to yeah. keep an eye out even more and, and, and see where this goes from here. But, but yeah, watching Gorman just for one second, getting back to that, I, I was trying to think, too, you, you can't help it. A lot of times you like to think of other fighters you can compare them to. He, I, I, I kind of want to put my finger on somebody, but I can't yet. And I kind of seem like you did. He, he looks like a guy who he, he is competent enough and he has enough that, you know, he'll, he'll be, he'll be in with some in his career before it's over. He'll be in with some guys that are in the legit top 10. I don't really see him really breaking the legit top 10, the way the heavyweight division strengthening up. Uh, again, of course, he's talking about it, but it hasn't happened yet. You know, Warren can put him and Dubois in together. Uh, you know, they can put it on uh, ESPN Plus in the U.S., even ESPN if they want to. That's where, again, let's just get the best in-house stuff we can at this point with, with these factions and then go to the next stage. You make an excellent point. Santa Cruz Russell should be made tomorrow. But, I, I you know, I look at that now and Gorman and Dubois, and, and Dubois is just going to be too strong for him. Uh, he's going to be too strong and too powerful, and um, I, I don't think that'll probably end well for Gorman. Yeah, is is there any other fight on either one of these cards or over the weekend that you want to chat about? Let's see. I think that uh, for me, at least, was uh, pretty much uh, with with as we see a lot a lot of action when you're watching all this stuff it, during the weekend. Yeah, that that was pretty much. Uh, uh, pretty much it for, for, for me over the weekend. Um, the, the, the pluses, I would say, on the weekend were, you know, uh, well, you know, really in, in all now with, with these platforms from a U.S. perspective, you got, you know, um, the pull-up fight was better than expected. That was on regular ESPN. You got, an ex, you got a great fight out of uh, Lipinex and uh, Lamont Peterson on FS1 in the U.S., which reaches a lot of households. It won't have me- reached many people, but the British card where you had those dramatic, we had that dramatic Maxwell fight that was available in the U.S. on ESPN Plus. So uh, it, it was out there. Uh, but, the, but the main point is that you had two fights that at least can get significant amounts of viewers with the pull-up fight and the Peterson Lipinets fight. That's where you try to build momentum in boxing, I think. So. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at that as, as the positive parts of the weekend. Yeah, the the only notable fight that I would mention is uh, the Jamonte Clark and uh, uh, Vernon Brown fight. Uh, I believe that was his first name. Uh, yeah, yeah. Nothing, real ex- nothing real exciting about it. Not and, and neither one of these not guys. Are, they're, they're not going to be top guys in, in, in the division. But uh, Clark, to me, just rem- he reminded me uh, of why – just – 
why guys reach the top and why they don't because he seems to have he has good hand speed he has good power uh you know he he dropped his man but the you know just watching him try to cover distance uh you know he kept doing the this hopping motion that you see with a guy like Adrian Broner where they can't cut distance as quickly as they would like because again they have this they have this bounce to their step instead of sliding you know, or almost like coasting where you see a lot of guys who have really good footwork where they, they just kind of slide effortlessly into position and, and cut off corners. This guy, he just reminded me of Broner. He just kept kind of hopping towards his man, you know, not working his jab on the inside. And he just got outboxed again, not a big, not a big fight. You know, these guys are not going to be, again, they're not going to be contenders in any division. Uh, yeah, but it, it was, it was just one of those performances that I, I just thought was noteworthy because I, I thought, you know, Brown had skill, right? I mean, uh, again, he has he has quick hands. He had good power. You know, there, there was power. something. He showed some power in, the, in this yeah. in this fight, at least. Yeah, yeah and he had a nice. A bad, it wasn't a bad fight. Um, well, these fights can be useful, but the problem to me is that they're not the best to be in the middle of a national TV card. Is usually what they benefit you as a fan is you'll you'll see then Clark or Brown maybe down the line in against a name guy and you know who they are and, you, and you've seen them, uh, you know, live, which is always better than tape to me. It's, there's just something about when you don't know what's going to happen when you watch the guy that makes a lot of difference. So, you, you know, in other words, if Brown or Clark ends up against a more name opponent down the road, you know who they are, you know what they bring to the table. You can, you can handicap that and, and, and get a better idea what's going to happen, but maybe not a fight to be sandwiched in the middle of a national TV card, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a bad fight. Yeah. Brown showed, showed some power Clark. And, and I can speak like you're saying about Brown, Jeremiah, that's where I can speak with Clark. I have seen Clark a few times before this, and this is what has been good about the PBC thing, going back to all the network, shows that when they were still doing time buys is that was the idea and, and it, it kind of worked and to some extent you, you've seen some of these guys before um clark is is my example just like you said with brown about some things he was doing wrong of you know you look he's got height he, he's got some skills but see he doesn't pass the firepower test there's just no there's no firepower with clark and for a guy of his height who you would want to see getting leverage on his punches and really being a big puncher. He's the opposite. He doesn't have firepower. And then even though he's got height, he fights inside sometimes. And, and that's not a, that's not a good formula where if he had the firepower with his other attributes, you know, he, he, he might, uh, he might have uh, more of a future to be a top 10 guy, but he's not, he's not going to be. Yeah, 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 and and again, stuff like that is oftentimes what separates the 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 doers from the the don'ts. You know, the do's from the don'ts. I mean, uh, both these guys again, they had something to work with, but couldn't quite get it done. But we didn't have a weekly show uh, last week, so I wanted to get your thoughts on Errol Spence versus Mikey Garcia. Uh, I, you know, I, I haven't been on Twitter a lot this week; uh, been pretty busy, so I, I haven't seen. I have seen a good number of people's thoughts about the fight, uh, you know, on, on the Facebook forums and whatnot. Uh, you know, some, as, as usual, or I think are hypercritical and, and, and taking, uh, they're, they're just doing too much with this fight, acting like Garcia just showed up to, to collect a paycheck and didn't put any effort forth. And then you have some people who are, uh, you know, Spence's, is uh you know the best in the world he's clearly the best in the world now and uh, you you get that from both sides but typically people work within a a more centrist uh frame and and you know they 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 can analyze correctly and then just kind of tease out the details a little bit better and and you know you're one of those guys so i wanted to hear what you thought of that performance well, I think it was, um, and you know, I've been high, and, and you know, because the show, uh, that's what's good about the show being recorded and these casts are available. You know, I've been high on Errol Spence for a really long period of time and, and thought what I saw of him, that he's been the best Walter weight to me for a while. I've, I've been even feeling that for a few years, despite what fights he may have had or not had yet. I think it was a case of Errol Spence just being that good, which I thought it was going to be going in. 
Um, I, I think Mikey Garcia showed heart, and I think he was in to try to win the fight. I think I, I don't necessarily always agree with or, you know, think Joe Goosen's my favorite, you know, color commentator of all time or anything, but I do think he made a good point during that fight that I agree with, and he is a trainer, so sometimes I like to uh, uh, go from there on, on some of these things when I am analyzing. I, I thought what happened there that what people were seeing – that maybe some of them weren't digesting correctly. And on Twitter, you saw a lot of that. And, and I did refute a couple of those because, you know, there, there's no question about Mikey Garcia's heart. He took the fight. The guy was one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. I think he still is. You know, he went up to full fledged welterweight trying to make this move. It was really an old school move. And, and it was a guy that started as a featherweight, but you know, I didn't have any problem with him trying to do it. Uh, daring to be great type of a thing. But but I think getting back to the Goosen comment, which I agree with, I think what people saw that they weren't understanding was, you know, Errol Spence, you know, was, was so good and hit so hard that Mikey Garcia couldn't, he couldn't defend in this fight and get any offense off at the same time. I mean, I think that's what happened. And that's what you were seeing over that 12 was that, you know, he, he was in, he was in with, with such, such a, a, a big, and, you know, there is no doubt that Errol Spence is bigger than him because Mikey, Garcia is making a real weight class jump here, uh, even too, when you think that he was a featherweight. So there's a difference there. And then with Spence talent and power and skill, Garcia just could not, he just got, could not defend and try to do anything offensively at the same time. And that's, that's, I think what you were seeing over the 12, that he almost had to think about it to try to throw anything at Errol Spence and, and then, you know, get back into his defensive positioning. And, and when he was trying to throw a little more late, to do something i mean you know you, you saw he was getting beat up and they they thought about stopping the fight and again he wanted to go on you could i don't know what people were looking at too because you could hear the corner i mean he's telling his brother robert garcia obviously unlike other fighters we've seen with modern technology and all the tv you can see what they're saying in the corner he's saying i want to keep going you know i don't want him to stop the fight and and he's going in there he's going out there getting pounded by spence for another couple rounds so i don't think it was as hard or anything uh, he, he just could not he could not defend and get get off with anything in that fight and you know cause Spence to dominate. I, I think really Mikey Garcia showed a better chin than I thought he had. I thought when Errol a guy like Errol Spence started opening up on him later in the fight, which is kind of what I thought would happen. I thought Spence would probably get him out of there and and he was not able to. So I think that was some credit to Garcia, um, but you know good performance from Errol Spence. You know, we'd like to see him against all different types of people, but being realistic, just to see how it plays out, I don't think anybody's going to pick against him. But, you know, if, if he fights Porter before the end of the year, and we'll see how that goes, you know, maybe we'll we'll get a feel for him uh, against another good guy that's been fighting that welterweight for his whole career. Yeah, I, I, I do think that's important. I, <clears throat> I do think it was a combination of size and skill. Obviously, you know, Spence being bigger, him being taller, you know, it's tough to get off against guys who are naturally bigger. And to me, Mikey Garcia, he looked soft at 135. You know, when I was looking at the weigh-in photos, he just didn't look like he belonged there. But it was one of those things, like even when they were in close – Errol Spence was able to outfight him, you know, so I, I think that showed, I mean, we all knew that Errol Spence was a damn good inside fighter. I mean, he's been banging guys out to the body for, you know, his whole career now. And, and that's part of what got him over the hump against, Kel, you know, Kel Brook. But I, I do think that it was telling that even when they were in close, even when the, the side, you know, the, uh, the range might've favored, should have favored uh, Mikey Garcia because he had shorter arms, Spence was still beating him to the punch. You know, Spence was still outworking him. He was still banging harder. <clears throat> I do, however, want to see him against a, like you, I want to, and, and like most other people, I want to see him against a, a guy who's been a welterweight. Uh, I, I do think, again, just like nearly everybody, that he beats Sean Porter. And I do think we are going to get that fight. Uh, at least I'm hoping so. Maybe I'm just speaking, you know, from, from a place of optimism. But it does seem like... Porter's people are willing to take that fight as well. I actually saw an interview. I, I didn't watch it all, but I saw an interview where uh, Sean Porter's dad said they'd be willing to take that fight. So 
you know, and, and you got to think that PBC are nudging them in that direction. It, it, it just seems like it's been too long for that not to happen. So it seems like that's going to be on the menu for these guys. And, uh, and um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm, lo- I'm looking forward to that. And hopefully we get, uh, I think, as you pointed out, and as we've talked about on the show before, you get Manny Pacquiao versus Keith Thurman. You get Sean Porter versus Errol Spence. And, and, and then the two guys uh, get together after that. And then you look forward to a Terrence Crawford showdown in the future. Yeah, I think, I think I'm a little bit encouraged. I think people are starting to get that, that, um, and I think Porter's people wanted Thurman again. It, that was a really good first fight. He's got a better chance to win, obviously, because he barely lost the first time. But I think you're right. What, what's going to happen is PBC is going to, you know, they're going to they're going to make sure Porter's well compensated, and they're going to say, hey, you know, and, and Porter's not getting any younger, you know, and he, you know he, he's this is going to be he's going to be well compensated, and he's going to be the one that's going to have to take this, the spend the Spence fight because. I think Pacquiao and Thurman want each other. The fans agree it's a good fight. It is a good fight. Uh, it's a fight that's going to be close in the odds. So nobody's got any problem with that. Uh, that'll that'll be a, Thurman's gotten exposure since PBC made this push. That should be a pretty good selling fight because both guys have had exposure. So and then you know the winners will, the winners will fight uh, if Pacquiao does somehow get by Thurman at age 40 and you never know because that is a pretty good fight I'm not saying I'd pick him but you know he doesn't want to be in with Spence and and we know how that's going to go but that maybe that'll just be the last raw fight where it'll be a big enough payday for Pacquiao uh, that he'll take it and the corner will uh, throw in the towel if it gets ugly that type of thing but even if people know that's going to happen with the sentimentality with Pacquiao, there's going to be people that are going to pay for it anyway. So uh, I think that's good. And then we would hope that, you know, but that's where you have to have a crossover. But if, if somebody wants to be wildly optimistic, I'm, I'm now actually in favor of these factions just doing their faction thing, but we call them out on making their best fights. So uh, Crawford's got better, even though they might not be great fights, even with top rank, Crawford's got better fights than Amir Khan. So, uh, you know, he's got to take those. And I would say, you know, Kabyalaskis and Jose Ramirez, uh, again, I'm not saying Crawford doesn't win those fights and he might not win them relatively easily, but to me, they're better than Khan and they're undefeated guys. Let's have that. Top, see, there are fights there that they're not making, and that's what I'm going to start pointing out. So let them have that in the meantime. And, and then, like you said, the, where there might be a little hope there is among the factionalism, I'm starting to think that maybe there's going to be a little bit of symmetry occasionally between ESPN, Top Rank, Warren, and PBC, where the PBC guys are going to be somewhat on Fox and somewhat on their own pay-per-views. The ESPN guys are going to be somewhat on ESPN and ESPN Plus and their pay-per-views. And maybe every once in a while, you know, these are major U.S. TV players, ESPN and Fox. They've got business concerns. That's beyond the, the the niche thing of boxing maybe they'll get together once in a while and do a joint pay-per-view, like a Fox ESPN pay-per-view, like for a Crawford Spence, if there's enough money there. That's probably not impossible. Uh, I'm not going to hold my breath, but, uh, you know, let, let's have these other good in-house fights mm-hmm. and stop frustrating ourselves and put the pressure on that way. And then, then maybe uh, with those players, you can get a joint pay-per-view. Yeah, and and you know, I'm just it just feels uh, so much of boxing's a waiting game. You know, it's uh, you know it just feels like Spence and Crawford are one and two, and and you just you're waiting for that fight. Like you know, it's not going to happen this year. You don't even know if it's going to happen next year, to be honest with you. And Bob Arum is is sort of in a tough place because you know, much of his welterweight showdowns have been in house, right? I mean, look at, you know, Pacquiao versus Vargas and Bradley and, and so many others, you know, so that's kind of, that's been his modus operandi for years now. And so he feels like he's in a tough place because I've even seen him tweet from time to time or, you know, snippets from these interviews where he's like, Oh, you know, Al Heyman's scared. He doesn't want to put his guys up against my guys. And of course, that that is a place of desperation because 
he realizes that you know PBC almost has the the market cornered in terms of top welterweights, and and you know if uh, I, I hate the alphabet trinkets are stupid, but uh, when you look at the landscape there, he's got all the titles on his side, and so again you know when he's when Bob Arum is trying to bring these guys up, like Kabyalowskis and uh, Alexander Bestputin, two guys who are talented, you know, different style of styles. You know, Kabyalowskis is more of an aggressor. But, you know, he's a puncher. Uh, Bestputin is a bit more like a Lomachenko guy. You know, kind of more of a stylist. Uh, uh, you know, he he is he can be aggressive as well. But what he's doing is he's he's got this European Eastern European farm system. And if the only guy you have to feed him to is Terrence Crawford, I can see how he feels maybe as if, uh, you know, he's kind of feed him to the wolves. He's not given them that opportunity, you know, it, it, the way it is in boxing, right? He's, he's not given them that chance to earn a, a quote unquote world title. And so their careers are going to, you know, maybe they're going to feel as if, well, both of them are going to feel as if they're, they, it's been unfulfilled. So yeah, I understand where he's coming from, from time to time, but to me, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you just got to do with what you have. And if it's Terrence Crawford versus, you know, best Putin or Kavulauskas, you just got to get that fight done. Yeah, right, and, and and that's right, and we didn't mention it, but I did see it, and and Dadashev had a had a big KO uh, where he had gotten dropped earlier. He's thirty four years old. He's fighting at one forty, but again, I think that you know historically people don't understand this. It really doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, okay, uh, Dadashev is one forty, but if we want him to be one hundred and forty seven pounds to fight Terence Crawford again, I'm not saying he's going to beat Terence Crawford or even necessarily threaten him, but he's thirty four. He's got to make a move. So I think it's just what you said, and I think there's been times where, you know, Al Heyman's had the same problem, and this is where I'm going to change my focus for a while to you got to make your in-house guys fight. And because I think they are looking at it, like you said, like, well, I got to take care of these guys and, and this guy might not want to fight Terrence Crawford or this guy might not want to fight Errol Spence. Guys, you can't ask the fans even though you have to take care of your fighters to be paying for mismatches, you know, for your in-house guys to fight no hopers or relative no hopers. I mean, that's what I think we're missing is, is they're using, I, I'm starting to see it now more. They're, they're using the smoke screen of, Oh, I can't make a deal for Crawford to fight Spence or vice versa for these guys not to be fighting the best in-house competition that they have. You know, it's like they've, they've distracted the fans and the commentators. So, Let's, I'm going to take it one step at a time now. <laughs> Give me your best in-house bouts, and then when you've done that on both sides of the aisle or the three sides of the aisle, then we, then we can talk about the crossover super fights, which we usually never get anyway. Yeah, it's just one big, like I said earlier, it's just one big waiting game. Yeah, it sucks, man. But, and it's, it's been the cause... I've noticed I've I've noted this in the past, and you know I'm, I, you know we're going to keep bringing stuff up like this on the shows, but this fractured nature of the sport affects guys' legacies sometimes detrimentally. Uh, you know we're, we're talking about uh, you know like you look at uh, top rank for instance, right? They had Vasil Lomachenko. Well, at 126, they were giving him a bunch of crap fights. You know, he didn't need to. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't remember the Asian guy that he fought. Uh, I think a Thai fighter. I mean, he hurts his arm and beats the crap out of the guy with one arm. You know, through the rest of the fight. Uh, you know, and then you you got um, Kosha. I, I can't remember how you say his name, right? But it, it, it was one of those fights where, or one of those things where PBC had Leo Santa Cruz. Uh, you, you know, and, and I, I believe they even had Frampton at the time. Maybe I'm mistaken there. Yeah, he, but it's he, one of those he things where a the, couple of PVC fights, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just one of those things that you know, Lomachenko, and, and that was at the time when I think Heyman and Aram were in a lawsuit. So it's it's uh, again, you look at those things. Well, you'd like to see as a fan, and in, in other sports, you want to have these barriers. But you would get, you would have had, you know, Lomachenko. Well, if you had a governing body like we push uh, in the, in this show as well, you could have had Lomachenko versus Santa Cruz or Lomachenko versus uh, 
you know, Frampton or, or, you know, one of these guys. But unfortunately, because they don't like each other, Lomachenko has to go to 130 and see what fights he can get there, right? So, you know, he fights Nicholas Walters, you know, who happens to be an in-house guy, and he has to fight other guys who are, uh, you know, top rank, has good relations with, and uh, it, it's, it's you know, it's it's just been this way for, for so damn long now. And it just, it just feels amplified to me that, you know, these guys, they're all great. It reminds me of the European political system, honestly, where, you know, instead of just Democrat or Republican in America, it's you have these parties and they're smaller and they've got to shake hands with smaller parties to try and build their coalition into a majority. And don't get me wrong. It's fine. You know, I, I like the fact that Bob Arum is shaking hands with Frank Warren. It's a good thing. Like, you know, like we talked about earlier, it's a good thing for 126. But it's also a bad thing for boxing when you can't cross party lines and, you know, have a good faith conversation with these people and get the, the fights we all want to see done. Yeah, they're just not doing it. And, and I've been like everybody else. That's what I've been pushing for, trying to figure different ways to get pressure on them to do it. But it's, it's just generally not happening because, you know, in terms of super fights with crossovers, I mean, really, really the biggest fights that can be made, you really only had it with, you know, not that you can't find smaller versions of crossovers, but with the really, really big ones, you only had real big crossovers which real, with real competing TV factions with, with Tyson Lewis and Pacquiao Mayweather. So, you know, think of all the years that have gone by, and that's all we've got. That's why I'm changing my view a little bit. That, that's happening so infrequently. Not that they shouldn't do it, but they're getting away. And this is all of them, PBC, Top Rank, you know, DAZN, uh, and and who they've got they're, they're not putting their best guys against each other uh you know the vast majority of the time and they, they need to they need to start getting their best guys in with each other and then then we'll, we'll even though there will be even better fights at the crossover they, these guys aren't even getting their best fight fighters in with each other most of the time and and they they need to start they need to start doing it i mean and that's where i'm going to take you know, if Warren's in the U.S. under the top rank banner, which he is now, basically, if if then they, that's to me one house. So they should be having all those guys fight each other. And same with PBC. You know, they, PBC's got the biggest roster. They need to have all their guys fight each other. You know, DeZone's got a lot of the middleweight guys. All those guys. You know, you're 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 hopefully going to start getting that with you know Canelo Golovkin, and they've got you know with Canelo Jacobs, and they've got Golovkin now. You know, they've got – basically, they've, let's face it, they've got all those guys HBO had. They've got to finish that and have those guys fight, all keep fighting each other. So, you know, let, let's let's make the best in-house fights we can get, get and we'd still like to get some crossovers, but, but start it out with getting some of these good in-house fights made. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, is that your final word, John, or – you got something Yeah, else. that's it. just one, one other. That was basically my final word because that's a little change in philosophy you'll hear from me, so I wanted to explain it. And I think you still need, like, a transnational because the way I vision what I'm focusing on now, at least for the, the short term, uh, getting these in-house fights made, let the factions be the factions, believe it or not, and see which one just gets stronger, if any. Maybe they'll st- stay equal. And, you know, you still need a transnational – Really, for the rankings, you know, just just you'll you'll be just ranking the fighters across all the factions, which is what you're kind of doing anyway. And and the, there won't be really cross sectional fights, which there usually aren't anyway. And but you know, the transnational will give you an idea of like here is the guy we think really is the best heavyweight in the world right now, you know, or, or this is the guy we think is the best light heavyweight in the world. In other words, you're going to rank them, and the, we'll look at that, and then it'll give you some perspective if there's ever a crossover fight or if a fighter is going to switch factions, which happens sometimes after a deal expires. You know, you, you'll, you'll kind of uh, have an unofficial value of what that fighter is. In other words, if, if Joshua was the number one heavyweight and he, for some reason, becomes a free agent from Hearn. And, you know, he, I don't even think he's tied to DAZN, really. But uh, wherever TV he's, he's going to be, uh, you know, then if he becomes a free agent, then the factions can say, well, Joshua was the number one heavyweight in the world and, and bid accordingly. I mean, until we get to something better, I, I think that's what we might have to, to deal with for a while. It's kind of like that. But like I said, I think they're getting away with not having the in-house fights. 
And then, you know, what I want to say, too, is um, I think it's unfortunate, and this is like with transnational where you try to get people to sign off on not having a conflict. You, you know, you've got boxing writers conflicted now with, with the corporate ownership of these, these different medias, and it's kind of absurd that you've got boxing writers who are supposed to be the – the watchdogs over the sport, just like a political journalist or anything, you know, especially in the U S system. And, and, and they're attacking fans and, and, and people who are criticizing the corporations. In other words, you've got the writers who are supposed to be the watchdogs and, and they're going out of their way to a- attack fans who are critics of, of these various corporate and promotional entities. And, and I think that that's a big concern. So that's going to be my final point that, uh, that's something that is really a, a, a problem that's creep, crawled into boxing that, that you've got to watch out for as well. Yeah, I'll piggyback off that point, actually, because, you, you know, I'm, I'm a writer myself. And I, 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 find, I just find it so unfortunate just the way the entire sport operates, because it, anybody who goes to journalism school, and, and I, I just want to preface by saying, I have never called myself a journalist, right? I know what journalists do. I, right? In one of the rules, I mean, just go to, uh, God, I know I can't, I probably can't even say it right, but go to Reuters, uh, go to their page, and I'm talking about the news source, right? They do worldwide news, and they have a journalism section. And in that section, they, they, it, you have a, an item, itemized list of, the rules of, of being a journalist, right? And one of them is truth is sacrosanct, right? So truth right. is the, the highest priority. That's why, you know, if, you, if you're doing your job correctly, you're checking your sources, uh, you're trying to separate yourself from all the bias, cut through the nonsense, and just, just you know, filter all the, uh, the biases that come along with the, the opinions and whatnot and serve that to people for them to digest how they would like to, right? More of a Walter right. Cronkite approach. You know, you know, I'm not saying Cronkite didn't have his biases. All humans do. But what I'm saying is boxing lacks that perspective. There are not – listen, if you listen to a guy like – just go to uh, – <clears throat> uh, just watch videos of Michael Montero, right? He's in, an independent guy, but he contributes to the ring and – and Boxing Monthly and other places. I mean, I've been following, me and Mike have been friends for years now, and, and I've followed his videos. Listen to the stuff that he says about some of the people who get credentials to these fights. We're talking about YouTubers, guys who are not journalists, guys who did not go to school for it. And again, I'm not saying you have to go to school for, you know, for, for journalism to be a journalist or be impartial or to be logical about these sort of things. I'm not saying that at all, but what I'm saying is he's saying that we're, we're having YouTubers, guys who clearly have an agenda, uh, you know, guys who are clearly not cut out for the position, asking stupid questions, uh, acting like fanboys in the press, uh, you know, not wanting to put anybody under the microscope for fear of never getting credentials again, uh, and, and like you said, and I, I think it's even even greater than it used to be, is you have the Ring magazine, and again, by and large, they do a good job, but they are also owned by Golden Boy, right? You have uh, a guy like Mike Coppinger, I, who I don't think works for the Ring. I think the Ring let him go recently. I, I like Mike. You know, again, I follow his stuff. He, you know, he gives you a lot of interesting notes. Sometimes it gets it wrong, but then again, sometimes we all do. Uh, you know, he's, he's working with, uh, who is it? PBC now. And so then afterwards he puts out a pound for pound list. So he put out a pound for pound list about two months before he created another pound for pound list. And without any fights in between that, all of a sudden he's got both Charlo brothers (laughs) on his pound for pound list. Right. So again, I, I think Coppinger again, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, start shit with any of these guys, but what I'm saying is, when you have these guys corp, you know, tied to corporate entities, they're not going to want to upset the, the higher-ups, right? Those are the guys paying their bills. And in right. a sport like boxing where it's hard to come by paid positions, I mean, all you guys listening who are writers or podcasters or, or any of that, you, you understand this very well. This is 
a tough place to get paid for. So when you get in a cushy position like that, you don't want to give it up, right? You, again, so you're not going to upset the, the guys who employ you. And this is yeah, the I big problem. Is, exa- that's what's exacerbated yeah. in boxing. I agree with you 100%. When the, when the big newspapers stopped having full box, and, and, you know, you always had some corruption, but it was in the minority in terms of in the past you had, you know, big newspapers. And some of these guys used to even be, full-time boxing writers with, with big newspapers when there was more money in it. But that's, that doesn't exist anymore, just like you said. And what, what I saw a lot this week, and I, I'm, I really don't think I'm reading it all. And, and you know, every, all the criticism you had uh, about those other conflicts really are valid, uh, Jeremiah. That's exactly what's, what's the problem. And it's because, right, you could say, well, these aren't bad individuals, but – they're just compromised because they want to pay their bills. There's not much position or money available in the sport for boxing journalistic type work anymore. And I I sensed in these last few weeks that there's just people, you know, the zone has put a lot of money in things and, and, you know, golden boy's got to deal with the zone. And like you said, golden boy, uh, you know, is the owner of the ring. I'm glad they saved it. And, you know, I think that they do a pretty good job keeping some of those conflicts out of it, but it's something that worries you. And and you've just seemed to me that you just had in the last couple of weeks, there's just, there's just guys trolling for his own money, you know, and because these things are getting bought up and it's, it's just, just for the reasons that you said, you know, there, there's not many paid positions out there. Uh, there's not, there's really not much money available uh, and, you know, people want to, people want to pay their, people want to pay their bills. And then, and then the way they'll get around it sometimes is they'll say they'll, because they, they understand the criticism that you just brought up. They'll say, Oh, I'm not a journalist. I, I never said I was a journalist. I'm a commentator, but, but everything they put out there would imply that you're, that they're doing journalism. So yeah, of course. It, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, 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 but, but, you know, it, it's there's there's literally been a role reversal where you've got writers. I mean, the writers are supposed to be the the advocates for the independent voices out there who who don't have the power or, or the fan, and you've got writers attacking the fan. <laughs> In other words, it's not writers attacking the corporate structure; it's writers attacking the fan for the corporate structure. Yeah, bizarre. R- Right. Yeah. And that's just, that's not how it's supposed to work. I mean, anybody who immerses themselves or even, you know, hangs out, you know, anybody who pays attention to politics, even part time, you understand that the media is a, a, it's a significant force. And like you, you touched on, it's far different when you have a sport like boxing and you've got a full time boxing writer at New York times which back in the day had a huge circulation. I mean, it just just go back and watch even a '70s sitcom or something. You know, it was it was just kind of a thing your father did, right? He picked up the newspaper and he went and took yeah. a dump in the morning and he and he read the newspaper, right? And because that that is you know because of much of the news is now consumed online, you know, through applications, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I mean, you a lot of the news sources in America have been confined to the coast, you know, New York city, California. And that has not only eliminated just uh, what, what you what I'm basically saying is just to kind of get to the point is you have far less eyes on the sport now than you did back in the day. Again, if right. you, any, any historian can tell you if, if there's a fight on uh, in New York city, you have the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. You got Time Magazine covering it. You got New York Times covering it. You got all sorts of local newspapers that are picking it up. You have uh, wires that are being transferred to you know other places in the United States. I mean, we're talking about you had tons of eyes on you, and a lot of these guys were critical. They, they had they exactly. had they had no reason not to be right. I mean, because they weren't beholden to the the promoters right. or the or the TV companies, but the roles have been reversed in that sense that, you know, you, these guys, you just get afraid because if you're a writer and you get credentials and you say something bad, well, they'll blacklist you. Uh, like I was talking about Michael Montero. He's, he's gotten some of that too. I mean, he's, he's lost gigs 
because he's asked tough questions of people. And so it's, it's an unfortunate aspect of the sport. I mean, they just have the promoters and whatnot have a lot more power than what they used to. And this is just, it's just one of the horrible aspects of the sport that I hate. Cause again, I'm not calling myself a journalist, but I do understand what journalism is and it, it's not this. And unfortunately there's a complete lack of investigative journalists so there's nobody going under the cover, like, you know, lifting up the nail and, and digging out the dirt and really telling you what's going on behind the scenes. Right. Uh, you know, I look at places like ProPublica and they're, you know, they're talking about stuff that's, uh, you know, happening in these oil and gas companies in California right. and, and you know, how they're responsible for uh, fires that are going on because of their neglect and wanting to collect profits. You have none of that stuff in boxing. Uh, well, you do have some. The, there, Thomas Hauser does do a little bit of that, but you know when he's tacking, you know places like USADA, it's not. It, Hauser does a great job, but he's, you know, attacking USADA is not going to get us to where these these you know alphabet soup organizations and whatnot are going to start tidying their house up and 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 act a little more respectable. Right, and especially again, I'm glad they saved it, and I think they do a good job overall. But you know, you've got. You know, he, he, he's got stuff in the ring, and, and, you know, Golden Boy owns the ring. So you're always going to have a little bit of that question of, you know, how, how, far, how far can you go or who your targets are going to be. That's why I find it tragic that it's come to this, but that's another reason why I've decided over these last couple of weeks that maybe for a while we're better off just going with straight-out factional, factionalism, calling it what it is. And, you know, these writers are – it's almost that way already, but we're just going to make it more out of the open that, you know, the, one guy's just, you know, for Golden Boy and another guy's for PBC and, and another guy's for DAZN and, and who they've got, and we're just going to call it what it is, and you're not going to expect anything more. It's sad because, you know, you're not going to get anything uncovered under the rocks and things, but like you're saying accurately, Jeremiah, this structure is not going to – take care of that. Um, there, there were some journals, even the old boxing magazines, we've talked about, but it's the truth. I mean, they would actually be critical. They would ridicule the alphabets, ridicule a lot of the promoters. And, you know, you, you, again, you just, you just don't have that anymore. Yeah, so on that negative note, we, we typically leave on, a, <laughs> on negative yeah, notes. We, we, we'd like to not. There, there, yeah, we have, but there are the plenty of negative notes again. to write. The only, if you want to circle back and you're a positive thinking person, which it is better to be overall in life, as we know, uh, just I would say for this weekend, you just look at the fact that uh, you had the, uh, the too high exposure for where boxing is at nowadays, uh, fights that turned out good with the pull of Dinu on ESPN and the Peterson Lipinets on uh, FS1, and you got a great highlight real fight with that Maxwell fight in the UK. Uh, so th- those would, those would be the positives to go with our negatives this, this week. Yeah. And so we're going to leave you with that. And as always, I want to tell you guys, you know, we're brought to you by my uh, the retired boxers foundation, uh, and you can listen to this podcast on Spreaker, Stitcher, tune in, uh, you know, iTunes, wherever you, where you, wherever you find podcasts, you can find us, uh, you know, give us a like, thumbs up, you know, YouTube, all that stuff, you know, and again, feedback is much appreciated. If you have any recommendations on how we can improve the show, uh, segments you'd like to see implemented, uh, in anything else, I mean, we're, we're open to that sort of stuff. So, you know, just send us a message and, and we'll be responsive to that. So, uh, you know, for your, now nah, I don't even know how Mike ends the show, you know, but I'm just going to leave you at that. And, uh, well, what what did he say? (laughs) I don't know. I'm your host, Jeremiah Pricer. Been talking to John Einronhofer. Have a good night. All right. Have, have, Have a good night, everybody.